So I don't think I really need to define uh, autism uh, for everybody in this room, right? Uh, but we all know that it's uh, impaired social communication, repetitive behaviors, and uh, stereotyped interests, uh, but it's a high impact and it's increasing generally in the latest uh, data. So um, there were two, we thought we had a handle on this. We had uh, uh, two major trials. Uh, we had this, found this excitatory to inhibitory imbalance, uh, and the excitatory primary neurotransmitter is glutamate. Uh, it is, um, and the primary inhibitory neurotransmitter is GABA, and glutamatergic activity, some evidence shows that it's increased in autism. There's a lot of evidence that GABAergic activity is decreased. So we thought, this is, well, okay, we got it. We, we blocked the glutamate or we increased the GABA. And there were two major clinical trials, one with mimentine that was actually used clinically for Alzheimer's disease to block the glutamate activity and one arbaclofen to increase the GABAergic activity. They both failed. Uh, they both failed to meet their primary outcome measure. Uh, some secondary measures look more promising, and the glutamate study was proprietary. Uh, well, they both were, but the glutamate study, the, the company hasn't really talked much about the data, but I know a lot of people that were involved with the GABA study, and they talk pretty freely about it, and they said there was a subset of responders um, and in fact, my former graduate student, Rachel Zamzo, wrote a really nice article about that in Atlantic Monthly very recently. She became a, a, a science writer, uh, and she's a good one. Um, and talking about one of those uh, uh, patients who responded really well, and they could no longer get the drug because it was not available. It was a study-only drug. Uh, Mementine, fortunately, is available. You can, you can get it for Alzheimer's disease. And, try to convince the insurance company to allow you to use it. Um, but that, that patient that she wrote about really did respond very well, couldn't, and couldn't, they couldn't access it. But wouldn't it be great to know who they are? And the big problem with autism is it's very heterogeneous. In fact, I've, uh, I would use the analogy of, of cancer. It was used earlier today as a great example. Uh, uh, because you have, you wouldn't expect the, the the thing that treats testicular cancer to work for lung cancer or vice versa. Uh, so there, you have, and this is not by any stretch of the imagination a comprehensive list. It's just a, a, examples. So you have a GABA mutation, NeurX and neuroligin mutation, fragile X, P10 mutations, but you also have some uh, non-genetic contributors, presence of maternal antibodies to fetal brain seems to be uh, popping up over and over again. Uh, and the area I work on with prenatal stress is, is coming out to look like a factor. And then you get idiopathic, which literally for anybody not in the medical field knows, we have no idea what the path is. Uh, we, have, we don't know what's happening. We don't know why they have it. That's just the fancy word for, I don't know. Um, but they all contribute to uh, the autism spectrum and a, and, and a bunch more, uh, but the, crowd, uh, the slide would get too crowded. So how do we organize this? Um, you can organize it by genes. You'll miss the non-genetic causes and you won't have a place to put the idiopathic ones. Uh, you can also cluster by phenotype, severity of, of uh, language disturbance, severity of repetitive behaviors. Uh, the research domain criteria approach that has been uh, espoused by uh, NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health. And biomarker clustering is another approach too, which allows you to be able to get at the, the whole group fairly well. And we'll talk about uh, this a little bit, uh, re-looking re at the mimentine issue. Uh, but more broadly, it, it seems like we're, I hope I didn't catch anybody over there with a the laser pointer. Um, more broadly, there has to be an approach that really takes all this into account. So you could, the, the classic genes first approach is that bottom right area. And you develop a new drug, uh, it, you base it upon an animal model, you base it upon iPSC, induced pluripotent stem cells, look at the physiology of what's going on, test it in the animal model and see if you can reverse those effects and you've developed a new drug for human beings, which is, it's great science, it's fantastic, but it, it, there's been a heavy investment in, in that alone, which does leave you a couple of gaps. Uh, one is you've fixed that gene, not any other. Uh, now maybe it car carries over to a broader spectrum of patients with maybe not that gene, but a similar issue. 
but it won't touch the other ones. Uh, so you need to really look at all of them uh, to really get a good handle on autism as a broader spectrum. It uh, misses the environmental factors, obviously. There, there are a few of those. And the, the latest heritability estimate suggests that it's a 0.83, 83% genetic. So you're going to be missing about a fifth or a sixth of cases that might be the antibody, the stress, or whatever else. Uh, and, and, and the other weakness is that's 30 years down the pike, or 20 or 10 years, if you're really optimistic, that this drug is going to translate. And our current child psychiatry uh, uh, formulation, uh, all of the drugs we give in child psychiatry, none of them have come from this approach. I mean, this is a relatively new approach. That's part of why, but nothing we use today in child psychiatry, I'm a neurologist myself, but I I'd sit next to the child psychiatrist in clinic and go and talk to them frequently. I also talked to my colleague, uh, uh, Kara's and my colleague Jeremy about this, and he actually mentioned this as well. Um, and the, the, if you're going to help somebody now, you're not going to get anything out of this. And so investing solely in that is going to, it's kind of saying, I don't care about you for 20 years. Uh, so we have to take other approaches uh, as well. I, that's my take on it. So the, the sole investment in this, in this uh, section is, I think, missing the whole picture because we find things through serendipity, and that's perfectly fine. Uh, that's basically how every one of our uh, drugs in psychopharmacology work uh, uh, and how they've been discovered. So, but what you can do is you can take a highly plausible uh, a drug with a highly plausible link to a biomarker and see if you can identify who's going to respond with that biomarker. And I'll get to an example of that a little bit later that we're working on. Or you can look at a drug with general promise just for ASD. You don't quite know how it's working, but that's okay. If you find something that helps, uh, I, I, I'm not upset with that uh, if you don't know why, but you can look and try to find out why. Uh, look at the clinical biomarkers to help suss out who it is that's going to respond. And um, go uh, and then see if you can develop an animal model or look across the animal models that you have uh, that, for the various different types to help sort that out. And so when we're looking at the animal models, you want to get an array of those animal models to really put things together, look for translational biomarkers, something you can look at in the humans, and see if you can how, see how that relates to treatment outcomes. And clinically, something similar, you want to see what these etiological biomarkers are that people have that might predict treatment outcomes and see if you can identify who they are clinically, if there's any way to sort that out, either through a biomarker or a phenotype. Now, Here's the tough one, idiopathic. What do we do with that? I mean, great, you can, you can sort out all the different genes and figure out how to fix these. Uh, but what do you do with idiopathic? And in this setting, what you need to do is see, that's where the biomarkers become very important, is you would look and see how those idiopathic cases fit. Maybe this has a biomarker profile similar to maternal antibodies. It's not going to make you completely sure that it's going to respond the same way, but it at least gives you hope. And maybe they have the GABA mutation biomarker. Uh, the GABA mutations, they have a patient that has similar biomarker profile to the, the people with GABA mutations. And maybe that GABA drug that we talked about earlier, maybe that'll work for, the, for that subset. Uh, and this is a very strategic approach. This is actually being done in Europe and in Ontario, Canada, something very similar to this. And, um, the EU AIMS approach, it's a multi-center uh, study for developing medications, and it's the single largest autism grant in the world. Uh, it involves uh, a partnership, uh, sorry about that, a partnership, I was intending to hit this, uh, yeah, a partnership between industry and the university. King's College London uh, is one of the key leader, uh, leaders in this. They have uh, Declan Murphy and Tony Sharman at King's College, Lon King's College London, and uh, Thomas Bergeron in Paris are the three lead investigators. Uh, and uh, it's it's a, it, it, with that partnership, they're uh, going they're looking at cellular assays with the stem cell, animal models, translational science, clinical, clinical research, and uh, genomics. And it's neither top down nor bottom up. It's really marrying those two points, just like we were discussing. And um, so they'll take, it's, and, and they'll take the in vitro models and in vivo models, the cell models and the animal models, 
try to understand what's going on, look for the translational biomarkers, and look at clinical development uh, of drugs based upon that. Fantastic. Uh, the province of Ontario has uh, done something very closely related. This is led by Abdokia Anagnosto. She is uh, wonderful. Uh, and this is taking translational approaches of clinical, multiple clinical sites and to look at uh, targeted clinical trials uh, based on a big biomarker core, core in developing parable, parallel animal and cellular models. She, uh, Evdokia actually, I was talking to her last month, she came to a conference we hosted, uh, and Kara was there too, and, I, I, and I, I was just so tickled that she's doing this, this is so, such a good approach. And she said, gee, I, I really hope we're getting it all right. And I looked at her and said, because you're asking that question, that means much more likely you are. Uh, but at the very least, we're going to get something interesting and get an understanding of some cases, uh, and hopefully a lot of cases, and at least sort out what's what. Now, there's a twist to the plot. Uh, looking at the, the phenotypic biomarkers, like the research domain criteria things, severity of language, severity of behavior disturbances. The EU Ames had a, a poster at the latest International Meeting for Autism Research, uh, a, a platform presentation, kind of like I'm doing now. And they looked at the research domain criteria and did a brain anatomy study with hundreds of scans of indi individuals with autism. They've got some statistical power. They didn't find much, which is very disappointing. Uh, Canada did this, uh, and this is now published. Uh, they, um, they actually, this is mouse brains. They took all the different mouse models and the maternal antibody models and a few of the other models, some environmental uh, oriented models, and just did volume scanning on the brains of those mice. And they, actually, they came up with nice little clusters. So it gives us a hint that tracking the etiology, the causes, the gen genetics, and all those pieces may be really important, and maybe the, may the good money bet if you're going to pick one, but I, you, know, you can definitely want to look at both. And that kind of makes sense, because it may well be that a maternal antibody case and a GABA mutation end up at the same level of language disturbance, and that research domain criteria uh, 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 pattern approach might not work for you, because if you give the GABA drug, it's going to help the GABA uh, uh, mutation patient, but it's not going to help perhaps the antibody patient, and you're going to think it's a negative study, when in fact you just didn't cluster it in the, in the optimal direction. Now, the European Union project, that's it's over, over $100 million, and the province of Ontario has got $28 million for this project. Uh, and so you think, well, everybody's already doing it. Well, there are opportunities in the United States. Uh, um, epigenetics is not as big a focus in those studies. It's, it's not devoid of it, but it's not as big a focus. The expertise for the environmental factors is mostly in the United States, and, that, and, and it's not really a major part of either of those studies. The clinical component, I mean, we have really pretty darn good clinical research resources in the United States, and I spoke to Declan about that. Uh, in the European Union, and they are not actually as strong in their clinical networking because they have multiple different countries involved, different languages. We actually have some really good things here as far as that goes. And also, Evdokia in Canada, when I was talking to her, uh, model organisms, they have, it's only mouse. And in fact, if you use rats, you actually can recapitulate more aspects of humans. Uh, so there are a lot of the different windows. And another really big factor is you may have noticed that when I listed the three principal investigators of the EU Ames project, that um, two of them are uh, from, excuse me, the two of them are British. And with Brexit, they are not eligible to participate in the next submission cycle. So, yeah, uh, that's incredibly unfortunate because those guys are fantastic and, and, and are a major part of why that's succeeding. And, and listen to Declan, you, you get a really clear idea. Um, and in the United States, we, we do have the Autism Cares Act, which is uh, quite, quite wonderful. It's why we have a bit of an extra support for autism research in the United States. And I would like to thank all of Congress and, uh, and the people that signed off on that. Uh, it seems to be some bipartisan support for that in most places. Uh, which is good. 
Uh, and, but this is individual projects, uh, which is uh, the model we usually use. The Centers for Excellence is also funded, that, but that's also certain sites with specific projects. And then the Yale Biomarkers uh, Partnership, it's not really targeting subtypes as much. It's a wonderful study, but it's not really targeting this whole subtypes approach. Uh, so we really don't have anything like what exists at, uh, uh, in the European Union or in, even in Ontario in the United States of that ilk. Um, we did have a, a, a summit we met and talked about. It's a paper. You can look it up. I made it open access for anybody to look it up. And it's a good paper not because I wrote it. It's a good paper because I asked all these people from Autism Speaks, from Simons Foundation, uh, Harvard, uh, uh, from uh, California, uh, and also Boston University. Uh, you know, it, it basically, you know, the, the Simons Foundation person made sure that I had everything ducky on my uh, section on the uh, induced pluripotent stem cells. I had uh, the expert at Harvard and the expert at the Mine Institute uh, keep, uh, keep me straight on making sure I got all the other environmental factors, because I only know I have expertise on only one of them. And uh, David Amaral, the director of the Mind Institute, was uh, just pretty fantastic in, in helping run such a large group of people through a meeting. And that's actually where that uh, slide came from. But it's really necessary for us to take this on in the United States, and I have proposed it. Uh, uh, and uh, hopefully we can gain some traction on that in the future, uh, a, a, a federal support or a, a industry federal partnership. Now, I said I'd give some examples of how this approach could work on a, at least on a smaller scale. Turns out uh, you can measure GABA and glutamate in the brain. It's, we're lucky there because MRI is, you can do MR, MR spectroscopy. And there's a, a distinct spectra for, for, for glutamate. And there's also one for GABA, which is technically more difficult to assess. But you can measure both of those in the brain with MRI, MR spectroscopy. And we actually found out that that is interrelated with connectivity, uh, which is the correlation between activated regions of the brain at, at rest or during tasks, which was really cool. We're, this has been submitted for publication. But that also allows us uh, to look at a drug. So we're, at, we're in the process right now, about halfway through this, of looking at uh, the, ga the GABA glutamate concentrations, the excitatory to inhibitory ratio, as well as uh, functional connectivity, see if we can predict who responds to that, uh, that mimentine, the, the glutamate blocking drug that is available out there in the market, because uh, Alzheimer's patients take it, and so we can access it and give it to these people, see if we can predict who's going to respond relatively straightforward. So that's that second line on that graph of you have a really, really, really good idea as to what the biomarker should be. So let's look there. Um, we're also uh, looking at a drug that's been around since the 1960s, and it's used for test anxiety. Uh, we initially started doing some single-dose psychopharm uh, challenge trials where we gave a one-dose placebo, one dose propranol, counterbalance the order. So half of them got placebo first, half of them got propranol. It's not like those copper wristwatch experiments where they, uh, they, they the wristbands, um, I had a good friend who, this is a quick aside, who uh, uh, was uh, wearing one of those copper bands and he's a, he was a strength coach for a football team. And he was with his, with his players in a, in a restaurant. And uh, some guy said, hey, I see you're wearing one of those bands. Uh, do you like it? And he said, yeah, yeah, he's a real smart guy. He's also a smart ass. He said, yeah, it, I, I love it. I haven't seen a bear since I got it. And he said, what, what do you mean? And he said, well, I, I'm afraid of bears, and ever since I put this on, I've never seen a bear. And he I said, and he was just baffled at him. He said, well, well, I don't understand. He said, no, nah, it's complete BS. And all the studies they did is they, they tested people's balance uh, without it, and then tested their balance again once they're used to the balance test, and they all got better, and that's PS, just nothing. And the guy said, I'm sorry you feel that way, I'm the owner of the company. <laughs> so that's really, really good reason why you need to do half people on placebo, half people on propranol first. Um, 
And, and in order to test this, what we want to do is find out what tasks respond to this. So we had a, a colleague of ours that developed a social outcomes measure looking at uh, how people stay on topic, sharing information, reciprocity, transitions, interruptions, how they handle that, how they manage that, and nonverbal communication, and eye contact, and created overall score. She was using it for a behavioral intervention, and I was like, oh my gosh, that's perfect. Let's try it. And we gave a single dose psych psychopharm challenge, and we actually had a significant improvement on a one point improvement. Propranol with a single dose. I, I was actually surprised it worked that nicely, uh, but that's that's awesome. Um, but you know, we don't know what a serial dose does yet. We also had these are high functioning individuals. So we had them do some verbal problem solving tasks. They also improved uh, with that as whoops. Uh, they also improved with that as well. Uh, and that's the they didn't solve more, but they solved them quicker, which is a more sensitive measure. And when the cool thing was is that we had psychophys markers. We actually had tried to track their heart rate variability and their skin conductance. Uh, and uh, we actually were able to, uh, the heart rate variability uh, and their anxiety measures uh, actually predicted who responded, uh, which leads us to have some promise that we'd be able to predict who is a greater responder in a clinical trial. And we did get funded f uh, by the Department of Defense, and we're now initiating that clinical trial to see if serial doses uh, are beneficial, and actually one in the audience was uh, John Rady, uh, actually did the first case series. Now we've done single-dose psychopharm challenges, now we'll get to do a clinical trial. And drugs been around for 60 years and used for uh, things like test anxiety, so we have, it's a very familiar drug. We're also gonna track brain imaging markers uh, because the effects on functional connectivity seem to also be interrelated with the drug effect uh, in the recent study we looked at. You can also subtype based on medical comorbidities. Um, we found that uh, that's those same heart rate variability markers are strongly associated with constipation. In a study with uh, Kara Gross Margolis, uh, who's, uh, who actually is the one who introduced me to the Center for Discovery. Um, and uh, it turns out the individuals with a history of anxiety is where that response is, uh, that association is the strongest. So, it does beg the question, this may be a different phenotype. You may need to help some patients with uh, you know, your laxative agent, but for some patients there may be an important anxiety component uh, to what's going on that may affect treatment, and it's something we need to sort out in the future. Uh, it also relates to cortisol reactivity, so there's definitely an important stress reactivity component. And this also, this is actually what tied us into the Center for Discovery piece. Uh, skin conductance uh, has been tracked there. That's part of the rich data set that they have. And uh, it turns out some patients have a buildup of behaviors two minutes prior to the behavioral outburst in skin conductance, suggesting a big anxiety buildup. Some do not. Uh, and we're going to be tracking this uh, in these patients and, and assessing this uh, data that's already in, in existence. And, um, we're looking at, we have data from eight of them already, and we're looking at, we find, uh, we're gonna look also at social transmission of it. I mean, so it's not supposed to be social transmission of much in autism, but there sure seems to be uh, for behaviors, uh, and that's an important thing. We've never really been able to subtype behaviors at all. Uh, there's, and this may actually have uh, pharmacological implications, because there's a subset of them that, as you can see, have a buildup of skin conductance activity prior to the outburst, and there's a subset that do not. Some people flip from one to the other, but the ones that have the buildup, there may be a different treatment approach is best for them. You could, you could intervene ahead of time in order to try to, 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 to decrease their anxiety and not have a behavior, but it also could have pharmacological impacts because maybe anxiety is the thing you need to target for, for this group and maybe impulsivity is the thing you need to target for this group. We've never really had a way to subtype behavioral effects. Now, none of this is possible without a team. These are uh, the people that are involved. Uh, Rachel and uh, Brad were the ones most heavily involved with uh, the pharmacological stuff we are doing. Um, and it was funded by uh, uh, HRSA, NAR, NINDS, uh, and uh, the DOD now is funding as well, some startup funding is as well. NAR was the pre predecessor of Autism Speaks. It's how we got our first brain imaging study. Uh, and now, thanks to the current DOD team, we're now uh, going forward on that uh, with the trial. And Brad is actually, uh, he's my postdoc in doing, leading the psychophys piece and uh, with the Center for Discovery. 
uh, and uh, Jeremy Vince Trevanderwheel and Kara Gross Morgellis were very were with me on the, the gastrointestinal studies, and uh, Kara is with me on the Center for Discovery work as well. Um, the uh, these are the papers that are involved. Uh, that I've quoted, they're all there, and that's why I like to live in Missouri. Uh, caught a particularly beautiful sunset one night. That is actually our patio. Uh, that's the Missouri River there, and it looks almost like it's straight out of uh, Lord of the Rings or something. So I think there's a lot of important things that can be done. Uh, hopefully we will get the opportunity to do this. Hopefully Brexit won't tank what's going on in Britain and Evdokia is plugging away in Ontario, and I would just love it if in the United States we can find a way to at least partner with Evdokia in, in her group in Canada, uh, and I'll continue advocating for it uh, and see if we can make something happen, because it's a big picture thing. It's, again, it's like cancer. There are many, many different types, and they all have a different treatment plan, and until we get a handle on that, we're still gonna be struggling. Thank you.